the Okay, thanks, Guilford. Um Ah, uh, I'm gonna read the little language here. Language for remote meetings. All right, so it says, "Hi everyone." Uh, pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, and extended by the Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022, this meeting is being conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time. And um, all right, so I think we're good to go. Thank you all for being here. Um, I will ask that we just take attendance out loud because Amber really appreciates it, especially for people who are quiet during the meeting. And um, I see now that Councillor Henneke has joined us and Eve Vogel has joined us as well. So can we just go around the room quickly and just um, everybody give their names so then Amber will record it in the minutes. So I'm Tracy Zafian and I'm the chair. And I'm Marcus Smith. I'm Stefan Cheech. Joe Federusso, TAC member. Chris Lindstrom. Okay, and we have two guests. So. So Eve Vogel is here and Mandy Johanneke and Guilford Mooring is here as our TAC liaison. All right, so we'll get started. Um, we do wanna try to end this meeting promptly. It's a little before seven, so 6.45 and Chris Lindstrom said she has to leave at 6.30. Okay, so, um, uh, all right, so, because um, Councilor Haneke is here, I'd like to just start with the street lights. Well, first of all, so we don't have any members of the public for public comment period. Um, so our first item up will be to, well, actually, Chris Lindstrom, if you have just like um, a few minutes, like three minutes or so, do you want to just give an overview of Safe Routes to School and the Great Eye Walk and our partner, the weather, who made it all possible and increase the turnout? And then we'll go on to street lights. Um, yeah, so Safe Routes to School, again, a federal program administered um, and I think supported by Massachusetts and the Mass Department of Transportation um, to make communities more um, bikeable and walkable for kids, starting at the schools. Um, we had, um, you know, approached the school district about um, uh, this pro project and thought that there would be a lot of interest. And um, this year we were able to identify and recruit parents and run um, sort of some initial uh, walk, bike and roll to school events um, at three elementary schools and at the middle school this past Wednesday in conjunction with the um, Massachusetts Safe Routes to School. Um, they were very successful. I think we ended up with um, mostly all green parents who never really organized events before. Um, but we ended up with about 150 families participating across the four schools, um, about 300 donut holes consumed um, as soon as the kids arrived at the schools and zero places for bikes at any of the bike racks, especially at the elementary schools. And there's a really funny picture of Derek Shea, the principal at Crocker, just like herding bikes into a corner, like not, not knowing where where they could go or what to do with them. But um, yeah, and I think um, I think it would have been a decent event, but the fact that we had really gorgeous weather on um, Wednesday morning, you know, definitely made a difference. And so people were on a high and really loved it. So lots of good positive feedback from the families who were on the rides and um, uh, an interest in doing more. So that's really exciting. That's some great momentum. So um, the Massachusetts Safe Routes to School program, they do run quarterly events like the IWALK. Um, and so I think we'll try to tap in and get the schools interested in those again. And it's great to see all that excitement and we'll have to work on more bike racks. So it's all a good problem. Okay, so on to street lights. So we, um, Councillor Haneke has come back to us. I believe we met with her 
very early in the year um, to talk about the streetlights policy. There have been many revisions to it since earlier. Um, I believe it's been before the council since August of 2022. Um, and so, so just for today's meeting, um, because I know that TAC, you know, we had met with her and with uh, Councilor Devin Gothier and had some general feedback. We didn't see the version that TAC saw was an early version, you know, and that was while there was still that second section in the streetlights policy related to where streetlights should be located. Um, so we appreciate the opportunity to learn more and to hear what the latest updates are. And um, this is an opportunity if TAC chooses to do so to give some feedback to TSO and the council. It is coming back to the council in November and I believe TSO will be discussing it at their meeting next week on the 12th. And um, in the meantime, I know that, I mean, I know that many of the TAC members know that I'm like personally interested in this and I have invested a lot of time and Eve Vogel is here and she spent a lot of time as well. And the counselors who are the sponsors have too. So there we go, we'll get TAC up to speed. So um, Mandy, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, so yes, um, this was referred out of TSO and to the Council for Action in August. And then um, there was some concern about the document that was referred out of TSO on a positive recommendation, um, particularly concerns from Eve Vogel and Tracy Zafian. So as sponsors, myself and Anna, we reached out to Eve and we have been trying to resolve a number of our differences. Um, we have not been able to resolve them all and we may not be able to resolve them all. Um, but I guess I'm here to talk to you about where the policy sort of stands now. I will say I apologize for not being able to get you documents ahead of time um, because of all of the back and forth and the schedules for myself and Anna. Um, we were not able to finalize some documents to send to TSO Tech and uh, finance the other committee this policy is in until today. Um, so they just got sent out to Tracy today. You will get that packet. I believe Tracy will forward it on to you. So you'll have all the documents. It includes a memo, um, the, the newest rever revision of the streetlights policy and a new task force committee charge proposal. Um, so I, I'm going to start with sharing my screen to show you some basic pictures of what our goal is for the streetlights policy from from a dark skies point of view. Um, as you as many have heard, um, I believe you can now see pictures, right? Is that correct? Yes. 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 Okay. I, I'm not getting the typical green box around the, the application that I normally get to confirm that. Um, these two pictures, that, well, four pictures, the pictures on the left represent what, what we would call bad lighting design. Um, one is of a building and one is of a street. Um, you can see there's very dark sections on the street, the upper left-hand corner, and very light sections on the street, and that the light really um creates these i almost call it a zebra effect that that creates some very dark sections of a street um and some very bright sections of a street the problem is the glare in in that picture and so when you fix the glare um they're the same fixtures the the other problem is that they're very bright white and so when you turn them to a warm white and you fix the glare you get what's on the upper right hand side of the screen much less um, no glare, which is helpful for visibility and for reducing um, light blindness, as some people refer to it as. Um, and and you just you you minimize that sort of zebra light dark contrast effect to make a much better visibility section of a road where things are more visible. On the bottom set, and I'll page up so you can see what's going on here, on the left again is a daylight bulb. It's 80 watts, it's unshielded, so the glare is tremendously bad. Um, in the picture, you can barely see that there's a door on the right-hand side between the first two lights there. 
On, on the right-hand side picture, you've shielded the, the wall pack, so they're fully shielded. There's no glare anymore. You've changed to 32 watts, and you've warmed the color down to 3,000 Kelvin from probably 4 or 5,000 Kelvin. And suddenly, you can see all the doors very clearly. You can see some of the mechanical sections between some of the doors, and you can see other doors. So you can actually see the pathway a lot better than you could in the other one. And then finally, what does glare do? This picture on the left, um, the only thing, the difference between the left and the right is shielding the glare, fixing the glare. And when you do, you can easily see that there's a person standing in that gate. You couldn't see that before the glare. So what we're trying to do, that, that, that shows you how much glare affects your ability to see things beyond the light. Um, and so what we're trying to do with our policy is basically remove the glare, improve visibility, and improve um, that, that ability to see. Um, let me, where's my mouse? So I, I just wanted to show you some of those pictures because not everyone has seen the difference that good lighting can actually make on a property compared to bad lighting. And and some of the problems we have with our street lights right now are that they're very bad lighting. They're they're very blue, but they also do produce a lot of glare despite the fact that they have some shielding. Um, and so what we're trying to do is fix a lot of those problems without reducing safety. Um, we actually believe fixing those problems will increase safety. Um, as you saw with the one street, you lessen that zebra sort of effect and you can actually see better. So, so the policy changes from the last time you saw it. Um, I will summarize some of them. The language is very dense, so I don't want I, I want you to just sort of be able to read that later, because um, I don't think it'll be effective to go through the actual language at this time. But what we've done since the last time you saw it is, and the last time I was here, we were talking about removing the streetlight placement standards completely. They are still essentially removed from this policy, you will see a section called streetlight location and placement standards. Those standards are a, a copy of what our current from the current streetlight policy placement standards are. That was a lot of peace. Um, the policy that the select board adopted in 2001 is still in effect. And these streetlight standards, placement standards that are in the document right now mirror the current policy. Um, intersections, dead ends, cul-de-sacs, where road conditions are deemed potentially hazardous, severe curves, downtown streets, streets with heavy nighttime pedestrian, bicycle, micro-mobility and mobility aid users, such as near, near schools and commercial centers, and other locations deems that, that the council deems require a streetlight due to demonstrated need. Um, it would be the council because in the current policy, it's the select board. And so we've just replaced select board that doesn't exist anymore with council. The goal of the task force that is a new addition to this policy, the creation of a task force, and then the charge for that task force is to have the task force come up with better placement standards, to look at our entire town, to look at where lights should be or shouldn't be based on what they are, what roads they are adjacent. Well, what, what, where the, what is adjacent to the roads? So a task force would come up with potentially a policy for the downtown area that might include a lot more lighting and a lot more light street lights because of the higher traffic and commercial activity and just pedestrian traffic that is there versus somewhere on say, off of Bay Road where there is less traffic, some of the neighborhoods off of Bay Road, there is less traffic, it's much more rural, it is adjacent to conservation and natural resource areas that we might not want to disturb the wildlife for, where they might have a completely different standard for where to put lights. That would be the task force's job. Um, right now our proposal is keeping the current standards there um, and saying, let the task force really dive deep into what do we want, how do we want to light this town with where the lights go. 
Um, and so we've created, we're proposing a task force and a charge for that task force. In terms of the performance standards, the shielding is still there um, and it has not changed. Uh, we have changed a little bit of the language regarding nuisance um, about glare um, in consultation with Eve and Tracy. And I believe we've reached agreement on what that language is, but I could be wrong. There's so many back and forth. We've revised the language for light trespass to a, a revision that I believe Tracy, Eve, myself, and Anna all agree can go forward to widen where the measurement for how much light there is, is taken. Um, the original proposal had it taken at the property boundary between the public way and the private property. We are now taking the proposal 10 feet from the finished edge of either the sidewalk that is closest to that line or the street that is closest to that line to make sure there is an adequate surround light. And we have increased the level of lighting allowed at that measurement from 0.01 foot candle to 0.1, so 10 times higher. Um, as a And with a goal that it only be 0.05, five times higher than the original proposal, but allowing up to 0.1. Um, foot candles, uh, which is approximately one lux. So, so we've we've compromised into a higher light trespass level onto private property in the name of trying to improve um, and address the concerns about safety regarding some of those edges where someone might be traveling um, on a sidewalk or the edge of a public way where a pedestrian or bicyclist might be. One of the items that still out is outstanding in terms of um, where we disagree still between Eve and Tracy and myself and Anna um, is the color cor cor the correlated color temperature CCT. We've actually moved significantly from our original proposal. Um, our original proposal was twenty two hundred Kelvin. Uh, 20, yeah, 2200 Kelvin. We quickly moved up to 2700 Kelvin. We are now proposing in our proposal um, a general level of 2700 Kelvin, but an increase to 3000 um, if 2700 is hard to find, up to 3000 Kelvin. And 3000 Kelvin is the lowest range of the Federal Highway Administration's general range of 3000 to 4000 Kelvin. We've also put into our policy a maximum of up to 4,000 Kelvin, that high end, which is no longer a warm white light, um, but the high end of the Federal Highway Administration for roads, arterial roads that have speed limits in excess of 40 miles an hour. So arterial roads with a 45 mile an hour speed limit or higher, because there is F Federal Highway Administration guidance, there's some studies out there that say, that show that at 55 miles per hour, 4,000 Kelvin provides better visibility in distance detection than 3,000 Kelvin, but at 35 miles per hour, the distance detection length is the same between 3,000 and 4,000 Kelvin. So in an effort to compromise, um, Anna and I have proposed a 4,000 Kelvin limit for speeds at the middle of that two, they only tested 35 and 55. So at the middle of those two, up going up to 4,000 Kelvin. But I believe that is still a disagreement between even Tracy and myself and Anna. Um, the illumination levels, we have proposed to meet the IES RP8 handbook. Um, meet them, exceed them by no more than 50%. So actually you can go over the handbook recommendations. Um, that handbook and those recommendations have been found by the Federal Highway Administration to be adequate and within the research for adequate detection distances and lighting maximums for those roads. So it's within Federal Highway Administration standards. Um, and that is the proposal we have, and you would be able to exceed them by 50% because sometimes there's some light loss over time. Um, and the 
other change, there are some other minor changes. We've tried to reword the waiver section and the adding or removing streetlights section um, to try and make it more clear how things go. And then finally, we have this implementation about the task force, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then a, a proposal to use a couple of upcoming projects or potential projects as demonstrations of of options under the policy. And that would include um, College Street between Pleasant Street and Railroad Street, where there's been a lot of construction recently that that construction will ultimately result in no street, no utility poles on the street. And so street lights will need to be replaced. They are currently on utility poles. And then North Pleasant Street between Eastman Lane and Pine Street, there's a little bit of work going on there and a proposal for an ultimately a, a redo of the entire road in terms of a, a complete street sort of reworking of stuff that's in TSO right now. And when that happens using um, that is also a demonstration of some options under the policy. The task force, the goal, as I said, of the task force would be mainly for um, for addressing the placement of lights and where lights need to go in town, where the fixtures need to go. Um, so they would have a lot of things to do besides that, besides the typical do their research, do outreach, get some public feedback and everything. They would be developing a lighting zone map um, on where zones should be in, in, standard light street lighting policies and light policies, towns are split into zones where a zone is supposed to have no light, low light, medium light, or high light, um, depending on what's in those, those areas of town. Um, so a zone such as a, a part of a zone um, where there is conservation land might be deemed a no light zone or a low light zone. A rural residential area might be deemed a low light zone. A high light or medium light zone might be some commercial areas. So, so the task force would be coming up with that lighting map. And then also the standards that go along with that map. I touched on that earlier, you know, in, in a conservation area, um, you might not want any light or very little light, but in a commercial area or where there is high pedestrian traffic, you might want more light or more frequent light so that it's more even across things versus just maybe identifying cross streets and putting a light at a cross street. So they would be coming up with those standards. The task force under the charge that we've drafted would also propose revisions to the policy to fit those standards into the policy. Um, but also standards related to, for some of these roads, things like that color temperature to really delve into where is the appropriate te color temperature for particular roads? What are the appropriate illuminance levels? Do we need them at a high two lux or five lux or 10 lux, or can we have them at one lux or a half a lux or even lower depending on where they are? And so the task force is, our goal for the task force was that they would really delve into that and really come up with a map and a plan that, that gets to in a very grain granular detail, all of that. Um, with that, I will stop um, and and let there be questions. But I believe Eve is going to do some talking too before this. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mandy. That was very helpful. So, Eve, are you ready to talk to? Yeah. Sure. Um, it'll be a fair, there'll be some repeat definitely from what Mandy just said, but I'll try to go through that part relatively briefly. And let's see, I can share screen. That's pretty exciting. All right. So we can see, um, Amherst streetlights toward a win-win solution. So, um, so this is, I think you guys have heard enough from me, but anyway, Tracy and I have worked really closely together. We've also been going back and forth with Mandy a lot. Mandy and I have met one-on-one um, -on -one several times. It's been a pretty intensive process and there's been a lot of back and forth. So this is kind of a broad overview of sort of where um, I see what we're trying to do. And then um, I talk about some broad areas of agreement that I think we're all on board with that sort of structure the whole thing. And then some specific areas that are not yet agreed upon. And I'm not going into quite as much detail actually as Mandy. Um, <clears throat> let's see if I can do this. 
All right, so this is kind of what our street lighting looks like now. We have occasional lights. Most of them are very tall. They light up a lot of area. There's a lot of glare. They go into the sky. So um, they do a lot of the things Mandy showed. And then it's also really dark, not that far away. So there's a lot of inconsistency. So it's sort of bad for the night sky. And it's also bad for any kind of visibility. Um, <clears throat> right now we have... Um, the definition of where we want street lights is by specific location. There are about 500 street lights across town. Most are about 6,300 lumens. There are some that are 27,000 or 50,000 lumens. Most are mounted on utility poles. That's because that saves money, but that means they're high up, which causes some problems. Um, problems with all of this. You've got a ton of uplight going into the night sky. You've got bluish LEDs, which was supposed to save energy, but causes, you know, some less optimal light, lots of glare. UMass is just a huge source of glare and excess of light. And then indoor lighting also is a big issue. Um, <clears throat> then you also have problems with darkness where people and vehicles can't be seen. Sometimes, as Mandy showed you, that's because of glare, but sometimes it's just because there's no light. Um, people can't see in those conditions. It's worse for young and old drivers, for mobility aid users, like um, people using canes or walkers, and for bicyclists who need to see farther ahead, longer distances. Um, and then in addition to all the people who are already out and this causes problem for, there's a whole host of people that don't even venture out at all because they find that it's too dark and um, they're just not even going to go outside at night unless they're in a car, unless they're poor, low income, have a job, and don't have a choice. <clears throat> is lighting really a big deal for safety? Yes, the research is very clear about this. Um, and these are some statistics, general ones on the left, Amherst ones on the right. Um, and I'm actually just going to let you skim this rather than reading it to you. All right. Um, it also matters for transportation mode shift. The research is pretty clear on that. Not um, There's not as much on this, but um, basically what you need in order to get the about 50 cent of people who just don't walk or bike very much, um, you need to get them um, to feel confident and safe. And lighting is a key part of that. And what you need really for people at night is you need continuity. You don't need bright light everywhere. You just need some continuous light so there's not these black holes of gaps in the lighting. And the research shows that minimum lighting is more important than any kind of maximum. So in other words, you're not getting, there's a certain minimum amount of light that you always have on a walking or, or biking route. Um, you need adequate sight distance for bicyclists, and you need higher lighting for intersections and marked crosswalks. So this is my approximation of what this might look like. And you'll notice there are actually no lampposts shown here. There's one implied over here at the crosswalk. But the point is you need a certain amount of light, but how it's provided by what kind of lamppost and where that light comes from is really like there's tons of different options for how that happens. And it could totally happen in a shielded light, which would be great because then it doesn't provide glare. <clears throat> so you put all this together and you get something that might be possibly ideal conditions for a high use walk, bike, bus area like a downtown. You make the lights lower down. You could even shield these on the side as well as on the top to reduce the glare further. And you get enough lighting for people to be seen all along the way as well as to see. Um, uh, you're going to start running into words like this as you get into more of the details. Shielding means, you know, you're covering this light so you don't actually see it when you're walking. That reduces the glare. The uplight is any kind of light that's going upward. The backlight is something that's going to make someone look silhouetted and make them hard to see. The spectrum is the color. Well, that's the Kelvin that Mandy was talking about. And illumination is sort of how much and how they're illuminated. <clears throat> Um, but you can't do this everywhere. Um, you don't want that much light everywhere. And it would be super expensive to have that many light poles and that many lights all over town replacing our 500 
um, street pole lights. So what do you do instead? You do the kind of thing that Mandy was talking about having the task force do, where maybe in downtown you do something like this. In a neighborhood, you might um, keep the speed relatively low and still deal with your one um, lamp post and allow it to be dark further away because your speeds are, speeds are low enough that people are still going to be pretty safe. Um, and then um, in a in a road that's an arterial road where you have high speed traffic and bicyclists are on the road, maybe pedestrians are on the road too, like my local alter, arterial East Pleasant. Um, then you might have whiter lights that are brighter. This is according to the Federal Highway Administration safety standards. They say 4,000 Kelvin on ar arterials. So that's why these are shown with brighter lights. So you might have different areas where you choose different things. This is all too much for us to figure out right now and um, would get us an even more back and forth detailed um, deliberations than we already have. So that's why the idea of the task force has really come up for, for a small committee to really look at detail at multiple manuals and really figure out what streets get labeled in what way and then what are the standards for each of those. So the broad areas of agreement among all of us is that you, you use performance standards. So rather than saying Guilford will have this exact kind of luminaire and this exact illumination, you know, location, it's gonna, what we're looking for is this is the kind of light we want and where, and then the specifics on the poles and the lamps and the, you know, angle, um, it, it had, there's some discretion about that, how that happens and where. You can still have those performance standards say things like fully shielded and no glare, um, but it, there's still some discretion about exactly how many and where and all that stuff. Um, secondly, we're gonna have a classification of streets by function, use, and safety. And then each um, classification will get, it's assigned a lighting performance standard. We're not gonna do that now. So that becomes the task force proposal. Um, then this, these standards with the classification, um, the geographic classification and the lighting standards, that's gonna get updated periodically, maybe every 10 years, 20 years basically in time to um, inform the next round of bulk purchase of streetlights for the town, as it, at least that often, um, because technologies are changing, research is being updated, and so we want our streetlights each time to be informed by the newest information. Um, <clears throat> the current policy will set some broad performance standards, but it isn't going to get into this level of the detail. It's not going to change the conditions too much from what we have now. It's going to create the task force, and it's going to create a framework for decision making, but it's going to leave, again, those details of the standards to the task force. Um, and then there will be some um, street lighting and, and alternative visibility safety trials on Amherst streets right now in the next couple of years, and then maybe in the future before the next round of revisions as well. So by alternative visibility, Mandy and Anna have really done a lot of thinking about the fact that there might be some places where with some really bright painting and some really well-placed reflectors, you might someday actually be able to take out a light and still provide enough visibility that's not going to be everywhere, but that might there might be some places like that, and so we should be open to that kind of trial in the future to see how it works before you know um, to inform future standards. Where are the continuing areas of disagreement? This is as of the last draft. We didn't see the one from today. Um, <clears throat> Tracy and I believe that lighting um, in the policy until we get the task force should remain either at the current lighting or within the range of lighting recommended by traffic safety experts, not below both. So for example, when Mandy was saying 2,700, the traffic safety experts say between 3,000 and 4,000, so we think it shouldn't go below 3,000. Um, safe systems approach basically means you're providing the infrastructure, including lighting, that's going to keep everyone safe, and including if they're stupid, if they're drunk, they don't have reflectors on, they don't have all, you know a lot of gear, they're really poor, they're whatever it is, they still should not be dead um, at the end of the night on our streets. Um, traffic safety experts, Tracy's really done a ton of work with her role in the um, transportation 
center at UMass, but the traffic safety experts are really the Federal Highway Administration, and then Mass DOT uses a safe systems approach. NACTO um, is the, the expert for bicycle design, bicycle route design. And then the reference manual must be freely available to public. We keep harping on this because the reference manual that um, Mandy and Anna have used is the IES 8 manual, and that is not available to the public for less than several hundred dollars. So we weren't even able to review it to see what it says. And so we really can't recommend that it be the reference manual for the policy. Um, <clears throat> one of the purposes of Amherst street lighting should be to facilitate more walking, biking, transit, micro mobility and mobility aided travel. I call that a mode shift, but um, this is some of the phrasing that got into at least one of the earlier drafts of the policy with something like this. Um, and the standards should be updatable. So the goal of the policy should not be to set the standards, but to set a framework whereby the task force and its successors can update the standards. Um, and that's it. Okay. Uh, sorry, yeah, Eve, just a quick question. Why shouldn't we use a, a manual that the town has access to? So I guess the question is, does the town have full access to the IES R8 manual? Um, if you go online, it is $350 for the public. So I guess- Oh yeah, I wasn't talking about the public, but I'm not asking why we wouldn't use something so, that the town has so, access to. Um, well, so a couple, so one, I mean, I asked Mandy and she said she doesn't have access to it, but I actually think it's really important that members of the public, including like the TAC, for example, be able to reference manuals and look at what it says and compare. Yeah, that, that's a different, that's a different thing though, right? You can create opportunities for them to be able to reference it. That doesn't mean they have to have access at their own house. Yeah, I didn't you say know, access to their own really. house. I mean, if the, if the town owned a copy, and right. then we one in the library. Them, yeah. yeah. If they if they part, if the but, town bought a copy and it was freely available at the library and reserve, that would count as accessible to the public. Right? True. I mean, I think in the but name we, of trans. Do we have a copy of that then or not? Well, Mandy hasn't seen it, so I don't know. Well, yeah, I mean I'm just asking if, if we're referencing something we have nobody has access to, that's kind of a Really so so. Guilford, I mean, maybe Kev, Guilford, have you as I as don't have Tibby? access to it. So, I mean, so here the director of the DPW does not have access to this guide that's supposed to be setting the standards. Yeah, no, that's fine. Really. Yeah. I'm just, you know, yeah. if, we, if we're referencing it and nobody has access, then that's kind of a new point. So. But, but I'm sure if we actually decide this is what we're going to reference, whatever we have, we would buy it and make it available. Understood. Thank you. Right. So, Chris, do you have a comment? Yeah, I just want to thank you, um, Mandy, Joe, and um, Anna, and Tracy, and Eve. I feel like the, I mean, people on TAC have heard me say this before. I didn't really like how this debate was playing out initially because it was such like a, you know, one side versus the other and I feel like you guys have really really found the common ground areas and um and so now we're really digging into the details and I really like the idea of the task force because I think you know policy that's so granular also becomes dangerous too and enabling the task force to kind of house that moving forward so I just want to thank you guys for um for being able to sort of, I don't know, shift the debate and the dialogue and make it a lot more um, comprehensive and sort of sound for the overall goals for our policy. Um, and then I just, one other thing, um, I do other types of lighting fall under this policy to, you know, i.e. a big commercial sign or um, lighting over gas stations. Um, I, I just was curious if this actually applies to things beyond the actual street lights themselves. Um, or, you know, even I guess homeowners might have certain types of lighting. Andy, go ahead. 
Oh, thank you. Um, not right now is is the quick answer. This, the goal right here is the streetlights only at this time. And I say at this time because Anna and I have always approached this as a two-part process. We would have had many towns put the street lighting standards into a zoning bylaw on lighting for the town. Some do not. Um, and we decided to approach this with a don't put it into the lighting zoning bylaw at this time because we weren't sure what kind of reception we would receive for dark skies type lighting in town. And so uh, from a legislative point of view, starting with street lighting that is in the control of the keeper of the public way, which is the town council only, and does not come with any time limits to negotiate and flesh out and do all of what we've been doing for the past year, felt like the right place to start. Our goal has always been if we get to a point and if the town was receptive to this and really supported this and we can do something with this to come back and figure out a way to put a lot of these standards into the zoning bylaw as a new sort of lighting um, part. That's where the classification, uh, the lighting zone map would come in because you wouldn't just be dealing with streets then, you'd be looking at the rest of the town and and when I talked about those lighting zones, a low light zone or a high light zone, that would then apply to the parcels in that zone too, and the lighting for gas stations and and you know parking lots and and houses and residential and all. There are some towns that have adopted stuff like that, and it's been a five to eight year um, implementation to get all the houses and private parcels. Uh, in compliance with a new policy, but that's sort of like step three now because the task force would need to do its work before we would approach any type of zoning to make it apply. But the ultimate goal is to not just have street lights dark sky compliant, but to have every part of town dark sky compliant. And then since we know UMass is not always subject to our own laws, be able to put the pressure on UMass to do the same thing from their own planning point of view. And now, I mean, there is, there are, when there are development proposals, like, I mean, unfortunately, Chris Pressup couldn't be here tonight, but there is consideration of lighting when there's redevelopment. And so there is some language already. It's just, we haven't looked very much, I guess, at um, private lighting, so. Thanks, that was helpful. Okay, does, it, does anybody else have other comments? No, I think it's a great starting point. I like the idea of the uh, committee on it. Cause, yeah, I'm trying to hack it out now. It isn't going to work. Best to really have a good look into it. So, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think that the, I mean, I think we all agree that the task force is needed because it's complicated and there needs to be outreach to find out how people feel about lighting in different areas. So, and so now Guilford, do you, can you speak to a little bit on um, what's the time frame for like when you can see there being um, like a large replacement of lights in town? Mm, there's not, there's not one scheduled. Okay. I mean, if you want to use the college street project as a, as a uh, guide, I, I think you're going to, You'll, that'll be a good one. So how much of the College Street project is going to be from Amherst College and how much is the town? Uh, we haven't decided yet. Okay. We haven't, I mean, we just got started. I mean, we've just been kind of playing around with the layout. Um, the Everest Force is getting all their stuff out of the way. We've reached out to the other utilities. We've talked to them. So it's slowly coming together and there has to be money for it too, which um, I'm not quite sure if there really will be any money. Okay, yeah. I mean, for the, I mean, just a general question, but I know when Amherst College, when there's been a number of improvements, you know, in terms of safety around on College Street and was that South Pleasant Street and so on, are those projects where the college was I mean I'm sure the college consulted the town but like was the college funding some of them themselves or was it also using uh town funds um it was a it was a lot of college money and, a lot, and some town money 
And we, I mean, we're talking to them. They're very open to talk and do things. Um, the, the college got kind of quiet after the downturn in 2008. Is that when we had the downturn? They got really quiet, but they're they're talking more now, so it's nice. So any other comments from the committee? Um, Just thank you for your work. That was great. Thank you for the presentation and the task force is a great compromise. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, I think for one thing for me is that just you know, like thinking about the time frame of when lights will be replaced. And I mean, even when I read and I have done extensive reading like over the past year about safety and lighting, um, you know, nighttime safety for pedestrians and drivers and other uh, road users, but um, just how quickly um, it's changing and how much even the researchers themselves don't know. Like one of the documents I was looking at recently, and I know I sent a link to the counselors as well, was about, it was a federal highway um, lighting guide. And they just came out in 2023. And in each of the sections that they cover, they say, you know, these are things that we've learned and these are things that we still don't know. And for example, they some of the leading researchers in this area, they still don't think that using like the CCT, like the warmness of the lighting is actually like a good way to measure to differentiate um, in terms of how lights will impact people. And so they feel like that, that's sort of developed in the industry. And so that people say we want lighting of certain Kelvins compared to lighting of other Kelvins, but there really there's like so many other components. Um, and also just in terms of, you know, what configurations of roadways with lighting, what configurations of lighting, like how everything interacts um, and even the leading research themselves are still figuring it out. And so I think, particularly as a traffic safety researcher and somebody who's always focused on um, saving lives and um, preventing deaths, I think. So for me, that's always a focus about particularly like what will we know, if, you know, how will the research be expanded and what new knowledge will we have before like this implementation happens and making sure that whatever detailed standards we develop aren't out of date by the time that happens. Um, and I mean, Federal Highway, you know, in the US DOT and Mass DOT, they're all committed to a safe systems approach, which is really to like save lives on the roadways to save all lives. Um, and even in cases where there are, and you know, it sort of follows like international vision zero principles that, um, you know, even if there are situations where the driver error or pedestrian error or or so on are contributing to people's own risks and people's own injuries and even people's own deaths, like for example, with drunk drivers, for example, but just to also like work on saving those lives as well. So, I mean, that's my, that's where I come at this issue from. And that's why when I originally made comments on the proposal a year ago, um, and it was pretty clear that the original proposal, which is so different from what we have now, but that it really hadn't looked at traffic safety at all at night, except for from like a crime perspective for pedestrians. So, but thank you. I appreciate all the work that's gone into it. So, okay. Um, well, so I guess the question is, so, um, I mean, so the counselors, the sponsors just sent us the their detailed um, latest version of the policy. They sent a cover memo, they sent the task force. Um, I mean, it's a little much for us all to like absorb right now. And I know we wanna end the meeting in 20 minutes. Um, so I guess the, just a question to the TAC members who are here, and I know uh, Chris has to leave in about five minutes, but you know, from this moving forward, the extent to which the TAC would like to make feedback to the TSO and the council, um, whether people want to review the documents, I just forwarded them to you. Um, I received them from Mandy about an hour ago. And if um, if people want to look them over and then send me comments alone, I can incorporate those into a feedback document and send that around for review. Again, we can't do any of it interactively um, to make sure that we comply with open meeting law. But um, that's an option I know in the past sometimes, right, that I've drafted something and then 
uh, people have been told to send their comments to Kim. Not to volunteer Kim because Kim wasn't able to make it tonight, but that could, we could do something similar. Um, TSO is meeting on Thursday on this. I mean, so if people agree that like the task force is a good idea, you know, we could speak to that. I mean, as a TAC, we could say we support the task force. If if people have other feedback, that'd be helpful to hear. So, so I don't know, Marcus or Chris or Stefan or Joe. So. You're wanting to hear right now? No, I mean, just like in general, I mean, just in general, I mean, I know. Okay. I know that none of the four of you have thought about this as much as I have. So, right, um, right, right. and just as a tack, you know, what do you think that is like the best path forward? And um, do we want to just as a tack while we're in session now, you know, in the next like 15, 10, 15 minutes, do we want to take any kind of motion and send any overall feedback to? No, um, I'd like to um, spend the time and read the report. Okay, sure. Separately. Okay. I'd, I'd prefer to read through it and just okay. make sure. All right, thank you. Sure. All right. That sounds like what we'll do then. Chris, does that sound okay to you? Yeah. Okay, great. All right, so I guess that's the end of our discussion for tonight. Um, if you want, I can send you our comments that we sent on the previous draft. Yeah. Of the continuing disagreements. So and I need to be reviewing it too. Um, I mean, the I just took a brief look at the cover memo while we were talking. And it's clear that it it's clear that the council sponsors like are using the memo to outline the areas of disagreement. So we'll see how that goes. So all right, well, thank you, thank you all for that. Thank you, Mandy. So are you guys thank thinking? You me. You're thinking you're gonna send comments to Tracy and potentially the TAC will. Um, do comments for the TSO meeting. Is that right? Yeah, I could compile people's comments if people want to send them individually to me. I mean, what what I've heard is right, that people generally support the work that's been done and the attention that's been paid and generally support the idea of the task force. But if people want to send specific comments, I will compile those. If you could please send those to me like by the end of the weekend, that would be very helpful. And then well, actually, Monday's a holiday, so, you know, by the end of Monday, I'll make sure that they get submitted. Okay, thank you. All right, so thank you, Mandy. Thank you, right. Mandy. Okay. So, um, let's see, what other business did we have? I didn't have too much else. Um, so while we were in this session, you know, in terms of others updates, that was the next item on our agenda. I guess before Chris leaves, actually, which is going to be in five minutes, if we could just set the date for our next meeting. Um, do we want to try to meet? Like sometimes we do meet twice a month and sometimes we meet months a month. Is there an interest in meeting on... Um, so not next week, next week, as I said, is a TSO meeting. So we can meet again on the 16th. How does that sound? To, I mean, I'm sorry, on the 18th. I'm sorry, the 19th, sorry. I'm I'm a little tired still from my conference. Um, does the 19th work for people to meet? The people who are here currently, which is five of us. I can do that. Okay, great. I can do that, yeah. Do that. yeah. Great, okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, I'll make it work. All right, thank you guys. I really appreciate that. Um, and if you do know anybody who wants to join TAC, um, we do have the vacancy now. I did get, I was emailed information about one person who was interested, so I may try to connect with them. But um, it's always good if we can have a full committee again. Um, okay, let's see what else. The um, Tracy, you said there's one more position? Yes, uh-huh. Well, since Tate left. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, I mean, I did... Um, Somebody said when they were out campaigning that they met somebody who's really interested in transportation. And so that person was encouraged to like fill out a, one of those interest forms. Um, yeah. I think if there's, I think, I'm not sure the town manager's office will take it up until they've received a couple different forms. But if we do find that we're having issue making quorum, then we could ask for somebody to be replaced. And I also saw Tate, I was at, um, I know Stefan was there too. I was at MassDOT's 
annual Moving Together conference, which focuses on different types of mobility and safety. And um, and I saw our former member, Tay Coleman there. Um, he's very busy these days with the micromobility project he's doing for the Berkshire Regional Transit Agency, and just to be a grad student, and he just won a graduate fellowship, like a national fellowship. So he's continuing to do great things, but unfortunately not with our committee. Um, okay, so one thing I wanted to, um, so in terms of status of road improvement projects, um, Gilbert, do you have any updates for us on those? You were saying that the is there still work to be done on Route Nine in the Northampton Road? Um, on Northampton Road, there's just a little bit of work to be done. There's some driveway aprons and just the striping is the biggest thing left to do out there. There's a couple of drainage issues they have to resolve, but other than that, it's almost 90, 98 percent done. Great. So I have one question is. Um, on the section that's closest to town, on the north side, the path is very wide. So is that intended to be a multi-use path that would include bikes as well as pedestrians? So even though it's not really lined, like there's no lines or anything for that? Do you know? You mean the sidewalk? Yeah, the sidewalk. That's... Well, because it's like 10 feet or it's quite big. No, it's meant to be an off-street bike lane. So okay. there's a bike lane and a sidewalk there. They had to move the bike lane onto the shoulder where the sidewalk is because there's a huge Verizon duct under there they couldn't move. Okay. So will that actually be striped to like differentiate between bikes and pads? It's supposed to be, yes. It's not okay. going to be kind of a, it's not like a multi-use path. Okay. Got it. All right. Thanks. That's helpful. I mean, I know that, you know, sometimes just from going to the disability access advisory meetings that sometimes they're concerned about multi-use paths or even multi-use paths where the uses are separated just in terms of like the safety, but, but I thought that was nice. Um, and then the other, the other project and, and Pomeroy Lane, um, mm -hmm. I'm hearing a lot of really great things about the roundabout and, uh, yeah, it's kind of fun to stand out there while you're working and listen to people as they drive by. What are they saying? It's pretty much they like it. There's very, good, good. very few negative comments, which is fun. Excellent. Yeah. Usually when we're out paving, it's it's usually a lot of negative comments, even though we're paving. But this is actually kind of cool. Good. That's great. And do you have any other big projects that are going on like this season? So we might start paving again here shortly, depending on weather. Um, so we may have some more roads we're paving. We are, they're definitely going to be working on College Street down to the, all the way to the substation. Sorry, I'm out of here, guys. Okay, bye. bye. Thank you. Um, okay. There's going to be work, work on Boltwood in front of Town Hall, which is part of the North Common project. Um, hopefully, we'll get the Kellogg Street. There's a little section that's not finished of sidewalk, which is supposed to be some, it's called Perky Pave. It's a per, permeable um, pavement that's supposed to go in. It's a brand name um hopefully we'll get that done before the fall um and now the plan with boltwood is still to make it um that whole section from main street to route nine to make it one way going north is that correct correct parking so on both sides when is that expected to be implemented yeah when the project's done it'll, that's where um, it'll be so well no what i'm saying it won't be like implemented kind of in the interim it will no What's the time frame for the project overall? Um, they'll, they'll wrap up sometime in midsummer next year, probably. Okay. What about the um, stop signs on Wildflower or wherever it is up in the wood in the woods? Yeah, the stop signs on Wildflower that hasn't been brought up as something to, for us to look at yet. So I um, sat in, well, I missed it actually because I had another conflict, but last Thursday there at the TSO meeting, they talked about the North Street, I mean, North Pleasant Street from Eastman to Pine yes. because I was coming back as a, because when it had been a referral item from the last council and the idea was to have an update on it. Um, my takeaway from that was that there still really isn't much funding to do the work there, but that there, the TSO may look at one specific area like where the near where the bus stop is um well or something 
So there's funding to rehab sidewalks. So okay. if, there's a, if, there's a, if there's a plan for an area to rehab sidewalks, there's money to do that. We're working on West Street right now. We're going from Pomeroy to, to uh, Crocker Farm. That's just right. that's just sidewalk rehab money. Um, yeah. North it was Pleasant, all, go ahead. Yeah. North Pleasant Street has sidewalks already, and we kind of have a plan of what we want to do. So we just started doing pieces of it, and the council's like, got a little concerned and some neighbors got concerned because we were implementing changes and then there's also a developer who were making changes no one wanted so we got sucked into the anti-development discussion so now we're going to probably bring the whole project back and go through it again when tso is so, talking about like how much they could do like before the end of the current council too so yes they're running out of days <laughs> yes. so and um okay um that makes sense i mean i it still sounds like a lot of it doesn't have funding so i mean i I'm, I'm not sure what had happened with that but i remember back in the summer of 2021 when this first came before tso and then we went out and we did the two different site visits with you and um like we did had comments then and so and i had shared that information with the tso chair but i will share it again just to like make sure because and in fact i mean even before i was on TAC, like i know that the previous like the earlier TAC, like had reviewed the project as well so i mean TAC has looked at that area quite a bit too yeah. which i hope would could inform the discussion a little bit so uh, although north our uh, sidewalks next year are going to be on um we're doing boltwood down by the common south common because we have a grant we have to spend the money we're also doing uh, sidewalks on um, uh, Belchtown Road past Southeast Street up to Colonial Village. So we have a grant for that. So those sidewalks will be the sidewalk areas we attack next year. Can those sidewalks be widened because those are on such busy streets that bikes really can't go on those streets? Well, you know, it, if we we possibly could, if people didn't have conservation land butting up against it and all these other things, um, we're widening it as much as we can. Um, there's actually a house in the public way on Belchertown Road. Um, I don't. Someone's proposing moving a house out there, but I don't know if that's the house we need moved. Um, but uh, how did the house end up on the public way? It was built back in like the 18s, 18, well, 1790s, that, that way back. back so more. could it be like, real? so I know in where I grew up that there was a, like a, well, there was a large, there was a large property and they realized when it got resurveyed that part of the property was going like into the public way. And so, and they had like big stone walls, like a lot of like work at the border of the property but they just relocated it all like they realized at some point they like made the property owner like give it back give yeah them. but the house is actually in the road so oh, it's I see. not in the road it's in the all sidewalk right. oh all right so if we want to widen sidewalks there we have to move the house or we have to shift the road uh north um so uh, but that that's those are where we're going to go next year so there's northampton we're I mean, not northampton belchtown road um Boltwood. Um, we'll be working on College Street a little bit, but not a lot. Um, but those are the, the two areas. We'll sp oh, Southeast okay. Street in front of the in front of the old school gets some work next year as well. Um, and hopefully that dovetails in with the school work across the street, but I'm not sure it will. And Kendrick Park, are there sidewalks there? The Kendrick Park plan is ready to go. We just ran out of money. Um, so we'll see how that goes. So the other thing that came up at the TSO meeting um, was just about people asking about like their roads and paving and things, and just like where are their there are where are their streets on the list? So I don't know if people have been reaching out to you, but it seems like people wanted to get updates about that. And I I mean I thought you did a lot of that those decisions like based on the index was, that was developed, like when you did the overall evaluation yeah, for the I mean, road surfaces themselves, right? Yes. Yes. I mean, there's a there's a paving contract waiting for money right now, and we think we figured out how to fund it. So everything came in over price. So we'll, we'll try to get that one. That one, hopefully, we'll get. Bid. Oh, it's already bid. Hopefully, we'll award the contract before the end of the 
middle of the month and then we can get started sometime before the end of the month. Okay, great. That's great. I mean, what what is sort of the limit of when you can continue to pave? Well, usually when around Thanksgiving is when all the plants wow. shut down. Okay. So as long as the weather is, as long as it's not raining and as long as it's above 45 degrees and temperatures rising, we can pretty much pave. Oh, great. Um, so, and one update I saw, um, which it was like too late to put on the agenda, but that the, um, well, the council on, was it Monday? Did the council meet on Monday? On the day approving like the idea of the safety zones? They have approved that they want to look, yeah, they're, they've accepted it. So now they can right. actually um, fund studies and then see what the to studies go say. Go into on safety zones. zones, right. So um, I, I know Marcus had sent me like some emails related to this, but just uh, for Stefan and Joe. So there's a section of Mass General Laws that if you approve it and the council recently approved it, then you can create safety zones in certain areas around like schools and daycares and other uses. Um, but it does require like to do some studies and so on before you actually create those zones. But now, now that this section has been approved, they can be created like once that work is done. Yes. So, I mean, realistically, go for it. I mean, do you think that they're, well, I guess if you have to hire consultants for the safety studies, like it could be a year or two before any safety zones are created. Would that be your real, realistically thinking? So, okay. yeah, actually, to tell the truth, we have lots of work, but we don't have a lot of consultants knocking on the door to do it. I mean, we, our surveyor is busy. Our, our, our surveyors we're using are busy, and they're not. Um, it's just interesting. There's a lot of work to do, and not many people who can have time to do it. And so, but, what's the time frame with the study that's that the the town just like signed a consultant to do it with the um, Fort River School intersections. Well, they came back and they don't like a uh, scope. They want to change the scope a little bit after we had a discussion. So uh, they're proposing a, an alternate scope and I haven't got the alternate scope back. So would that just be like, um, you know, like, I mean, what would be the time frame for that? I guess, would uh, that be something done in the next like year? Probably, hopefully we'll get so. it done before the spring. Okay. Do you really want to know what the consultant said, but you can't tell anybody I, I told you this? Well, you're being recorded. So I don't know. You might not want to say it, okay. but <laughs> some you people do watch the meetings, but yeah. You want to know why we chose that site for the school over the other uh, side. They uh, said that you, we have to get our pocketbook out for the school site we chose. Interesting. And we're, there's, yeah. That's all I'll say. Okay. There, was, there was other colorful like, I'm sure. Too. It was pretty cool. I'm sure. I've you never know, had them tell me anything. They've never talked to me like that before. And I was like, really? Wow. Okay. Well, it's good to have those good, close consultant relationships. So, all right. Mm -hmm. So I guess um, I didn't have anything else. Uh, Marcus, Stefan, Joe, do you guys have anything you want to cover at the meeting? No, we're good. No. We're good. Okay. So then... I'll make a motion to adjourn. Uh, does anybody want a second? They all second it. All right. Yeah, when I can find my new yeah, All go. right. Okay, thank you. Right. See you guys. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thanks. Bye -bye. Thank you, Joe's Bye. cute baby who gets to come to our meetings. All right. We'll Take care. You. We'll see you next We're time. We're all about transportation soon. I'm sure. All right. Bye. Okay, take care.